So I was asked uh, at the break, especially in light of my comments about Galatians being, uh, Theodore's Galatians commentary seeming almost Lutheran in places, uh, whether Luther made any use of Theodore. And the answer is no, he didn't know anything about Theodore because uh, the tradition, the Antiochene tradition ended up really being lost. Um, I'm expanding the map a little bit on this slide so that you can see Rome, which wasn't even in the picture, like Rome and North Africa weren't even in the picture on the first slide. Um, you have this Alexandrian style exegesis and you have this Antiochian style exegesis, and that's two out of the three original great seas of Christendom. Um, so before the founding of Constantinople and before it began to uh, claim rights as the second Rome, um, there were these three bishops who were the most powerful bishops, the most influential bishoprics in the Christian church. And two of them had this uh, specific uh, characteristic kind of exegesis associated with them. Uh, Rome didn't. And so the question is, like, which one ended up being influential in the West and on Rome? And uh, it wasn't the Antiochene. Beryl Smalley says in her uh, book, The Bible in the Middle Ages, um, to write a history of originist influence in the West would be tantamount to writing a history of Western exegesis. It was otherwise with the Antiochenes. They exercised so slight an influence on the West that the evidence may be discussed here and now rather than in a separate chapter. The allegorical method, and this is still Smalley, captivated the Latin world could be used more freely since it had ceased to be dangerous. Neither St. Hilary nor St. Ambrose regarded as, as an instrument of speculation as Origen had done. So Origen got into trouble with it, um, but in later times, the Latin fathers made their allegories conform to orthodox theology, which was more clearly defined than it had been in Origen's time. The educated Roman convert was a rhetor, that is an orator, rather than a philosopher. The contrast between Christianity and pagan philosophy troubled him much less than the rustic simplicity of the scriptures and their artless style. He missed the conventions and carefully prepared flourishes that he was accustomed to. The allegorical exposition satisfied some of his longing for complexity and ingenuity. I don't know why, St. Augustine says, referring to the text of the canticle, thy teeth are like a flock of sheep. I feel greater pleasure in contemplating holy men when I view them as the teeth of the church, tearing men away from their errors and bringing them into the church's body with all their harshness softened down, just as if they had been torn off and masticated by the teeth. Wow. <laughs> Didn't know I meant that, did you? Um, so uh, that's uh, Smalley's idea of why it appealed to the Western mind more. Uh, there was also this going on, and that is uh, Origen and Theodore were both posthumously condemned as heretics in 553 um, in the Second Council of Constantinople. But Origen had a head start on Theodore. Like that was 300 years after Origen died. It was only like 120 some years after Theodore died. And so Origen's works had had a longer time to spread and to uh, impress people one way or the other um, than Theodore's had. And um, Origins also, uh, I think, were just more in with the, uh, with the spirit of the times, with what people were expecting a holy oracle to be like. Um, they were expecting the oracles of the one true God to be mysterious, to be deep, to have depths that you couldn't plumb just with a surface reading. Like that was, that was the expectation. Um, that was the expectation from the pagan past. The, the pagan oracles were always like that, of course. You know, they were these dark riddles that you could easily misinterpret. Um, and uh, that was one of the things that was one of their claims to be profound. And certainly the true oracles of the true God wouldn't be less profound. And so there was that going on too, I think. Uh, Origen was speaking the language of, the late, of late antiquity and how they expected things to be able to be interpreted if they were truly divine. And um, Theodore was kind of sitting over in a corner saying, no, nah, you can't do that. Stop. And so they were both condemned as heretics, but Origen had spread 
So much so that even people who ended up rejecting him as a heretic still interpreted the Bible the way he had. So St. Jerome is an example of this. Um, Jerome was a very enthusiastic originist early in his career, and then he became aware of some of Origen's speculations like about the uh, pre-existence of souls and things like that, and he uh, turned on Origen, um, and he turned on his friend Rufinus, who translated a number of Origen's works, including the On First Principles, into Latin. Jerome turned on Rufinus, too, because Rufinus continued as an exponent of Origen, and they had a big nasty split. And um, or Jerome began saying that Origen was a heretic, but he continued his exegesis. He continued to use a lot of the same methods that Origen had used. And so that happened a lot. Um, you, didn't have to, uh, you didn't have to buy into all or Origen's ideas in order to find his exegesis interesting and useful. Uh, and then also, when Theodore was condemned, he was condemned for Nestorianism which was a, a, a heretical dispute that was still very much alive and like political and active and present day when he was condemned in the sixth century. Uh, whereas Origen was condemned for his speculation that the devil would eventually be saved, which almost nobody you know, believed anymore or had for a while, that, that you had to be a real serious hardcore originist to, uh, to still be speculating about that. So um, the... Uh, Antiochian tradition ends up, uh, well, it's not just Theodore, of course, it's Nestorius. Nestorius was an Antiochian. Nestorius was a student of Theodore, um, and he uh, ended up as this heresiarch, as this arch heretic. And so Theodore's works didn't get copied, or if they did get copied, they got attributed to other people. And um, Origen, people said, yeah, he had some. He had some bad ideas, and um, he went too far, but man, he could interpret scripture. So I'm going to talk now about St. Augustine of Hippo, him, he, he being the, uh, the giant of the Roman and North African tradition. He was North African, um, but uh, North Africa had a whole lot of influence in Rome in those days. And um, he, uh, his exegesis is definitely along the Alexandrian line, but we are going to see some differences. This is from his confessions. This is part of his spiritual biography. This is part of his testimony. Um, he was posted to Milan. He had a job working in the government in Milan, and that gave, him, that gave him a chance to hear Ambrose. At this point in Augustine's life, he was a manichae. He rejected the Catholic faith. Uh, he thought that the Bible, that the Old Testament was full of absurdities, uh, that, that God was pictured as, as a body and, he, and, um, in, in a, and that God was made out of matter according to the Old Testament in a way that was not acceptable. And um, so he was not that interested in the Catholic faith, but he was a professional rhetor, and Ambrose had this reputation for great eloquence. And so he was interested in going to hear Ambrose preach for that reason. So he says, although I took no trouble to learn what Ambrose spoke, but only to hear how he spoke, Yet together with the words which I prized, there came into my mind also the things about which I was careless, for I could not separate them. And while I opened my heart to admit how skillfully he spoke, there also entered with it, but gradually, and how truly he spoke. For first, these things which I had begun to, which also had begun to appear to me to be defensible. Oh, for first, these things also had begun to appear to me to be defensible. And the Catholic faith, for which I had fancied nothing could be said against the attacks of the Manichaeans, I now conceive might be maintained without presumption, especially after I had heard one or two parts of the Old Testament explained, and often allegorically, which, which when I accepted literally, I was killed spiritually. Many places then of those books having been expounded to me, I now blamed my despair and having believed that no reply could be made to those who hated and derided the law and the prophets. I heard him indeed every Lord's day, rightly dividing the word of truth among the people, and I was all the more convinced that all those knots of crafty calumnies which those deceivers of ours had knit against the divine books could be unraveled. But so soon as I understood with all that man made after the image of him that created him was not so understood by your spiritual sons, of whom the Catholic mother you had begotten, of whom of the Catholic mother you had begotten again through grace, as though they believed and imagined you to be bounded by human form, Although what was the nature of a spiritual substance, I had not the faintest or dimmest suspicion. 
Yet rejoicing, I blushed that for so many years I had barked not against the Catholic faith, but against the fables of carnal imaginations. For thou, O most high and most near, most secret yet most present art holy everywhere, and nowhere in space, nor are you of such corporeal form, yet you have created man after your own image, and behold, from head to foot, he is confined by space. So a little testimony from Augustine here that part of his conversion to true Christianity away from the cult of the Manichaeans was actually accomplished by the allegorical interpretation of scripture as he heard it from St. Ambrose. And it was important to him to have cleared away this calumny of the Manichaeans that uh, the Catholics taught a God who was composed of matter. So now, uh, I'm going to talk about a case study. Um, this is the, the interpretation of the psalm inscriptions, particularly as, as done by Augustine, but a little bit of other stuff too. The psalm inscriptions are what it says at the beginning of a psalm, you know, a psalm of David. Or the more complex ones, it'll be a, on the gittith, a psalm of ascents, or um, a, a psalm of the sons of Korah, those things, they are inscriptions uh, sort of stuck above the psalm in modern Bibles. In the Vulgate and the Septuagint, both, they were actually the first verse of the psalm. So you know, if, you, uh, if you work with Vulgate or Septuagint psalm numeration, you have to get used to a few irregularities. One is that most of the psalms are off by one number. The other is that most of the verses are off by one number because if the inscription is um, more than just of David, it's probably a verse of its own, and that sets the numeration off. And uh, this, when I discovered that like Augustine actually used these things in the interpretation of the Psalms, that was a fascinating discovery to me, because like, I had grown up believing that the Bible was God's inspired word. Sure, every part of it. But did that extend to the inscriptions of the Psalms? I wasn't sure. You know, when I was in graduate school and I first ran into this, are the inscriptions of the Psalms part of scripture, really? Like, or are they just like uh, historical notes that may or may not be the case? And um, seeing them actually as verse one of the Psalm, I'm like, well, why not? <laughs> they're, they're part of it, aren't they? They're part of it, yeah, aren't they? They didn't come, they weren't applied from somewhere else. And so maybe, uh, maybe it is licit to in include them in the interpretation of scripture. But then what would you say? Like, how would it affect the interpretation of the psalm? Well, sometimes it's fairly obvious, like a psalm of David when he fled from his son's Absalom, right? That actually, uh, that's the psalm where David says, I will, uh, he, said, he says he's afraid and his enemies are pursuing him, but he trusts in the Lord and therefore he will also lie down and sleep and will wake, and will wake in the morning and will be safe. <clears throat> Okay, you put that in the context of he's being chased by his son Absalom, and actually that does help you interpret the psalm. Say, so, uh, this is not just uh, theoretical. David is actually on the run, on the lamb, worried that, you know, with a very real threat that he might not wake up um, safe. But um, some of the other inscriptions are not so obvious as that. You know, and usually it just says, of David or, or to David, right? And this is... This is part of the um, ambiguity here. Like in, in the dative, in Latin and in Greek both, like the, the dative can be to or for somebody, but it could also be a possessive dative. So it's like, is this, uh, is this a psalm of David or is it a psalm for David? Um, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna follow that rabbit trail. But... Uh, <laughs> The psalm inscriptions were used a little bit by Theodore. Uh, like if, if it referred you to a, something that was going on in David's life, then he would, he would use them. But aside from that, he didn't make very much use of them. And that might have had something to do with Theodore, his teacher. Uh, Theodore actually had a theory, which he probably, I mean, he must have gotten from the tradition preceding and probably from a Jewish tradition before that that the uh, psalm inscriptions were actually not always matched up with the right psalms. Um, the, the, the theory was that the book of the psalms had been lost uh, during the uh, Babylonian captivity and the psalms had gotten out of order. 
and the scribes had put them back together in the order that they thought was right and the, and the inscriptions accordingly, but they hadn't matched them all up correctly. So that might be why Theodore didn't use them much. But Augustine really made a lot of use of them. So here's an example. Psalm 8. To the end, for the wine presses, a psalm of David himself. And you're thinking, which psalm talks about wine presses? Well, if you look at a modern edition, it'll say, to the choir master on the gittith. Or is this one gittith or one of the other Hebrew words? Is somebody looking at it right now? Yeah. Gittith. Yeah, okay. The gittith, which uh, modern scholars think must be an instrument from the Philistine city of Gath. And that's the best reconstruction that they can put on it. It's some kind of an instrument, and the, uh, and the choir master is probably, like, these are choral instructions. These are musical instructions. But it was not clear in the Septuagint that that's what they were. It said, to the end, for the wine presses, a psalm of David. So Augustine comments, he seems to say nothing of wine presses in the text of the psalm, of which this is the title, by which it appears that one and the same thing is often signified in Scripture by many and various similitudes. We may then take wine presses to be churches on the same principle by which we understand also by a threshing floor, the church. For whether in the threshing floor or in the wine presses, there is nothing else done but clearing the produce of its covering, which is necessary both for its first growth and increase and arrival at the maturity either of the harvest or of the vintage. Of these coverings or supporters then, that is, of chaff on the threshing floor, the grain, and of husks in the presses, the wine is stripped, as in the churches from the multitude of worldly men, which is collected together with the good, for whose birth and adaptating to the divine word that multitude was necessary, this is effected that by spiritual love they be separated through the operation of God's ministers." For now, so it is that the good are for a time separated from the bad, not in space, but in affection, although they have conversed together in the churches as far as respects bodily presence. But another time will come, the grain will be stored up apart in the granaries and the wine in the cellars. The wheat, says he, he will lay up in garners, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So at the beginning, at the beginning of that, you're like, what? Churches? But by the end of that, he's quoting this, and well, that kind of that kind of fits that verse at the end there. That's kind of nice. There is another interpretation concerning the wine presses, yet still keeping to the meaning of churches. For even the divine word may be understood by the grape. For the Lord even has been called a cluster of grapes, when they that were set before sent before by the people of Israel, brought from the land of promise, hanging on a staff, crucified as it were a bunch of grapes. And this is the spies who went to spy out Canaan and they came back with a great big cluster of grapes hanging from a, from a cross, kind of, from a staff anyway. Accordingly, when the divine word makes use of by the necessity of declaring himself the sound of the voice, whereby to convey himself to the ears of the hearers, in the same sound of the voice, as it were in husks, knowledge like the wine is enclosed. And so this grape comes into the ears, that's a funny image, as into the pressing machines of the wine pressers. For there the separation is made, that the sound may reach as far as the ear, but knowledge be received in the memory of those that hear, as it were in a sort of vet, whence it passes into discipline of the conversation and habit of mind, as from the vet into the cellar, where if it do not through negligence grow sour, it will acquire soundness by age. For it grew sour among the Jews, and this sour vinegar they gave the Lord to drink. For that wine, which is from the produce of the vine of the New Testament, the Lord is to drink with his saints in the kingdom of his Father, that must needs be most sweet and most sound. And then, if you didn't like two interpretations, the third, wine presses are also usually taken for martyrdoms, as if when they who have confessed the name of Christ have been trotted down by the blows of persecution, their mortal remains as husks remained on earth, but their souls flowed forth into the rest of a heavenly habitation. Nor yet by this interpretation do we depart from the fruitfulness of the churches. It is sung then for the wine presses, for the church's establishment, when our Lord after his resurrection ascended into heaven. For then he sent the Holy Ghost, by whom the disciples being fulfilled, 
preached with confidence the word of God that churches might be collected. So in, a, in a, his On Christian Doctrine, De Doctrina Christiana, his uh, like how to interpret the scripture, actually a treatise he wrote in four books on how to interpret the scripture. It's, an, it's interesting reading. Um, he says in there that uh, you know, there's, there's no problem with multiple interpretations of, of a verse. Uh, you might, you, you're not sure maybe whether it's this one or this one or this one. Um, but go ahead and bring them all out because the Holy Spirit is capable of multiple meanings as long as, it, as, long as they're orthodox and in, uh, as long as they're in uh, accord with the rule of faith and charity, um, then, they can, then they, they can be used and useful. So he goes ahead and gives three possibilities there. Now, this is not just commenting on the inscription. Since it is the inscription, he takes it as sort of an interpretive key for the rest of the psalm also. So here's an example of that in Psalm 8. Um, later, uh, this, is, uh, this is the part where um, you made man a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor to rule over the creation and put under him all the oxen and the sheep and the birds of the field and the beasts of the field and all that. This is that part of the psalm. And he says, well, if you take that literally, it's not that impressive. You know, Jesus is exalted over the whole earth and even over the beasts of the field. <laughs> Come on, I mean, that's not that impressive. So he takes it allegorically. Yea, moreover, he says, the beasts of the field, under this word moreover, not only the beasts of the field, but also birds of the air and birds of the sea, who are going to change halfway through this into fish of the sea. I'm not sure why that is. I don't know. <laughs> That's probably an error somewhere along the way. I'm just working with the um, translation that was available. Um, which walk through the paths of the sea are to be taken in. What then is this distinction? Call to mind the wine presses holding husks and wine and the threshing floor containing chaff and grain and the nets in which were enclosed good fish and bad and the ark of Noah in which were both unclean and clean animals. And you will see that the churches for a while now in this time unto the last time of judgment contain not only the sheep and oxen, that is, holy laymen and holy ministers, because, you know, the sheep are the flock of the Lord, and uh, the oxen are the ones you're not supposed to muzzle when they tread the grain, which uh, Paul applies expressly to paying your pastor, right? So the oxen, they chew the cud, they're the ones who chew the cud so that the difficult scripture can be simplified so that, the, so that it can be... Uh, given to the people. And then the sheep, they also chew the cud, right? So that the, um, and in fact, this is, I think, starting with origin, if not before, this is one of the explanations the fathers give for why chewing the cud is one of the requirements for an animal to be considered clean, because chewing the cud is a picture of ruminating on the scripture. So, long tradition there. What's that? Yes, there you go. Inwardly digest. If you've got two stomachs, you can do a better job of it. So, um, you have two parts of the brain. That's true. So, uh, where was I? Not only, not only sheep and oxen, but moreover, beasts of the field, birds of the air, and birds of the sea that walk through the paths of the sea. For the beasts of the field were very fitly understood as men rejoicing in the pleasures of the flesh where they mount up to nothing high, nothing laborious. For the field is also the broad way that leads to destruction. And in a field, Abel is slain. Wherefore, there is cause to fear, lest one coming down from the mountains of God's righteousness, for your righteousness, he says, is as the mountains of God, making choice of the broad and easy paths of the carnal pleasure, be slain by the devil. See now to the birds of heaven, the proud of whom it is said they have set their mouth against the heaven. Behold to the fish of the sea, that is, the curious who walk through the paths of the sea, that is, search in the deep for the temporal things of this world. Now these three kinds of vice, namely the pleasure of the flesh and pride and curiosity, include all sins. With a reference then to the meaning of the wine presses, not only the wine, but the husks too are put under his feet. To wit, not only sheep and oxen, the holy souls of believers, either in the laity or in the ministry, but moreover, both beasts of pleasure and birds of pride and fish of curiosity. 
Fish of Curiosity. That'd be a good band name, don't you think? <laughs> All which classes of sinners we see mingled now in the churches with the good and holy. May he work then in his churches and separate the wine from the husks. Let us give heed that we be wine and sheep and oxen, not husks or beasts of the field or birds of the heaven or fish of the sea. Not that these names can be understood and explained in this way only, but the explanation of them must be according to the place where they are found. For elsewhere they have other meanings, and this rule must be kept in every allegory that what is expressed in the similitude should be considered agreeably to the meaning of the particular place or passage. For this is the manner of the Lord's and the apostles' teaching. So having given us this allegory, which seems very fanciful to our ears, he says, but you've got to keep it in context. <laughs> like, fish are not always going to mean this. They just mean it here. Well, how does he know they mean it here? I think it's from the inscription. The inscription mentions wine presses, and otherwise, otherwise we wouldn't know that that's what's intended here. Here's another example uh, from Psalm 6. To the end in the hymns of the eighth, the Sheminith, that's usually, I think, not translated in modern Bibles, a psalm to David. Be we then willingly ignorant of that which the Lord would not have us know, and let us inquire what this title of the eighth means. I mean, of the eighth, this is a musical term. I mean, modern scholars think it's a musical term having something to do with the octave. Which would make sense, right? But they didn't have this, that notation there. Um, did Hebrew music not have the octave? I, I, they used different theory, I believe. Okay, well, you might have to take that up with the Anchor Bible. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'm not remembering exactly what they said. The day of judgment may indeed, even without any rash computation of years, be understood by the eighth. For that, immediately after the end of this world, life eternal being attained, the souls of the righteous will not then be subject unto times. And since all times have the revolution and the repetition of those seven days, the seven days of creation making the week that then repeats, that perhaps is called the eighth day, which will not have this variety. Okay, so the eighth day, this is something you may have heard of before, like if, if you've taken any classes that mention patristic exegesis, the eighth day may have been mentioned. Yeah, Arthur Just mentions it. Um, you know, baptismal fonts in the early church were usually eight-sided. Um, this psalm, this psalm had a big influence on that, the idea that there was something of, on the eighth. Well, on the eighth what? On the eighth day. There's seven days of creation. What would the eighth day be? Well, that would be the end of the world. That would be what comes after the end of the world. That would be the eternal state, the new creation into which you're being baptized. Right. Which connects to circumcision. Circumcision on the eighth day, yeah. So this is not, like, this is not original with Augustine. All right, it's not all original with Augustine anyway. So then later in the psalm, uh, verse 7 the psalmist says, my eye is disordered by anger. Well, modern translations will say grief, but the Hebrew word can be either one. Is it by his own or God's anger in which he makes petition that he might not be reproved or chastened? But if anger in that place intimate the day of judgment, and the theme of judgment has been introduced by the inscription of the psalm mentioning the eighth, how can it be understood now? Is it a beginning of it that men here suffer pains and torments, or Probably it is a beginning of it. I got those backwards. It is a beginning of it, that men here suffer pains and torments, and above all, the loss of the understanding of the truth. As I have already quoted that which was said, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, for such is the blindness of the mind. Whosoever is given over thereunto is shut out from the anterior light of God, but not wholly as yet while he is in this life, for there is outer darkness, which is understood to belong rather to the day of judgment, that he should rather be holy without God Whosoever, while there is time, refuses correction. Now to be holy without God, what else is it but to be in extreme blindness? If indeed God dwell in inaccessible light, thereinto they enter, to whom it is said, enter into the joy of your Lord. It is then the beginning of this anger, which in this life every sinner suffers. In fear, therefore, of the day of judgment, he is in trial and grief, lest he be brought to that, the disastrous commencement of which he experiences now. And therefore, he did not say, my eye is extinguished, but my eye is disordered by anger. 
because I'm suffering right now the wrath of God. And if I don't repent, I will suffer fully the wrath of God. But there is still time to repent. So, and this is, I think, the psalm which says, my couch is wet with tears. If it's not exactly that one, it's the same kind of one David's talking about, you know, being struck with grief and crying a lot. And um, you might, like, if you, if you projected his sin to Bathsheba onto this psalm, then you might say that he was uh, repenting, but you wouldn't necessarily make this connection that he's beginning through this, uh, that he's actually describing the beginnings of God's judgment upon him, but rather he would be describing his penitence. And then later in the same psalm, after difficulties so great, the pious soul, by which we may also understand the church, intimating that she has been heard, see what she adds. Depart from me, all you that work iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. It is either spoken prophetically, since they will depart, that is, the ungodly will be separated from the righteous when the day of judgment arrives, or for this time present. For although both are equally found in the same assemblies, yet on the open floor the wheat is already separated from the chaff, though it be hid among the chaff. They can therefore be associated together, but cannot be carried away by the wind together. And if you're thinking, wow, he's really hitting on this idea that some of you guys I'm not, some of you guys I'm preaching to aren't real Christians. He's really hitting on that hard. Like these are sermons, most of them. Um, well, remember when he's preaching. Remember, Augustine is a bishop and preacher at the end of the fourth century. So during his lifetime, Theodosius uh, I makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire for the first time. Um, but it's still less than a century after Constantine stopped the persecutions of Christianity. So this is, you know, the, the ball is getting rolling in Augustine's time of this being like actually the official religion of the Roman state. And so this is the time when you're having all these people flocking to the churches who maybe wouldn't be flocking to the churches if, uh, Rome, if the Roman power was still set against the Christian faith. And so um, a little evidence that Augustine has... Uh, pastorally very much on his mind, the fact that a lot of these people he's preaching to are probably not in it for the right reasons and really need to be convicted and um, become true believers. And then one more from the same psalm. Let them be turned and confounded. After this, he added, exceeding quickly. For when the day of judgment shall have begun to be no longer looked for, when they shall have said, peace, then shall sudden destruction come upon them. Now, whenever it come, that comes very quickly, of whose coming we give up all expectation. And nothing makes the length of this life be felt but the hope of living, for nothing seems more quick than all that is already passed in it. When then the day of judgment shall come, then will sinners feel how all, that, how that all the life which passes away is not long. Okay, so there are 11 psalms that mention the sons of Korah. And um, I've got the numbers there for you. Augustine doesn't comment on that name in two of them, but he works it into his interpretation of all the others, the sons of Korah. Now, Korah historically was a leader of the revolt against Moses. So that's in Numbers chapter 16. He and a bunch of his followers were swallowed up by the earth, and then some others of his followers who were offering incense to the Lord were destroyed by fire, and um, then there was a plague that struck some of his sympathizers in the camp. So, uh, but Numbers 26.11 expressly says, the sons of Korah did not die, did not die. So his sons apparently were not gathered with him when the earth opened up. Maybe they did not join his rebellion. First Chronicles later mentions Korahites, descendants of Korah, as gatekeepers in a temple. And Second Chronicles 20.19 says that the Levites of the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice at a public convocation that Jehoshaphat calls before a big battle. So probably the correct interpretation of the sons of Korah, or at least, you know, Augustine and most... Uh, Medieval and ancient exegetes would caution the historical, the correct historical understanding of the sons of Korah would be that they are a group of Levites who sing psalms sometimes, that possibly compose some of the psalms that they sing. Um, 
Now, of course, Augustine, like Theodore, believes that David composed all the psalms. So his version of it would have to be that David composed it and gave it to the Korahites to sing. Um, but either way, that's, that would be the literal interpretation here. And the literal interpretation does get used a little bit. Um, OK, I'm going to come back to that slide, because that's not where it is used. Um, Ambrose, second half of this slide, in his commentary on Psalm 48, he simply identified the sons of Korah as the ones who'd been appointed to sing this particular psalm before the ark. So like this was a conclusion they were capable of coming to, but it doesn't mean that they were going to use it in their interpretation, because what use can you make of that in your interpretation? Hillary, commenting on Psalm 42, interpreted for the sons of Korah as a warning to those who might otherwise follow Korah's bad example. Quote, because if anyone wanting to know immoderately oversteps the measure of the Lord's distribution, as Korah was by trying to take what was rightfully Aaron's and Moses's, that is the leadership of the people of Israel, he has found in the foolishness of Korah and is spiritually called a son of Korah. So according to this interpretation, to be a son of Korah is a bad thing. He said the psalm taught those who were prone to insubordination to focus instead on God and to long for him as the deer longs for the springs of water. That's the psalm we're talking about here. <laughs> Ambrose on Psalm 44 said that after Korah died, his sons needed stepfathers to teach them the right way to go, to keep them from following in the destructive footsteps of their father. So Psalm 44 gives the kind of advice that a wise and godly stepfather might give in such a situation. The first verse reads, O oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. And Ambrose urged, so let us hear what these fathers proclaimed to the sons of Korah. So these are two examples of somebody who wasn't Augustine um, going to the historical text and saying, well, what would it mean if the sons of Korah were descended from this guy who got spectacularly destroyed by God for rebellion? And they interpret it with that in view. Augustine does not take that path. Uh, Augustine here shows himself to be uh, um, quite a bit like Origen, actually. Uh, you know, Origen himself might have taken that path. Augustine just goes with the meaning of the name. The meaning of the name Korah. Jerome had published a collection of Hebrew names uh, that he had not compiled himself originally. He said he translated it from the Greek. Um, he said that Origen said it was originally Philo's collection. This is something that modern scholars have not been able to corroborate, but that was what Jerome said. This was Philo's collection of the meanings of Hebrew names translated into Greek that now Jerome has translated into Latin. And um, so Augustine has access to this. He doesn't know Hebrew, but what does Korah mean? And uh, Jerome's book gives three words as possible translations. Calvitium and Calvities, which means baldness, and glacies, which means ice. You know, ice is bald, I guess. So um, he doesn't use the ice one at all, but he does use the baldness. The sons of Korah are the sons of baldness, or the sons of the bald one. And um, I checked the Hebrew. This is, in fact, a legitimate interpretation of the Hebrew word. It has something to do with a root that relates to pulling your hair out to be bald. <laughs> so, um, it's coming up with the text for the liturgy of this week, right? So there are, three, there are three uses that Augustine puts this to. Three very fascinating, edifying, doctrinally rich uses, actually, <laughs> from baldness. Um, so I want to see, can anyone here suggest one? Yes. Well, I, I seem to remember. Um, Remembering is cheating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Someone, uh, uh, some some children making fun of one of the priests by calling him "get get out of here, bald head." That was the prophet Elisha. Yeah. Well, you got one of them. This is like this is like Family Feud. You got one of them. <laughs> Did you have your hand up? I think the same one. Okay. Because I'm embarrassed, man. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassed, <man. laughs> And also, you hate children. Anything else? Elisha is one of them. 
although you might not be able to predict what he's going to do with it. Yeah. Maybe uh, Samson's head being shaped? That's not one of them. Uh, probably could have been. But Isaiah 50, giving my cheek to those who pull out the beard. He could interpret that the same way as the third one. Yeah. Okay. Psalm 44, to the end for understanding, that's a masculine, one of those Hebrew words that modern translations just don't translate, to the end for understanding to the sons of Korah. This psalm is addressed to the sons of Korah, as its title shows. Now, Korah is equivalent to the word baldness. And we find in the gospel that our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified in the place of a skull. It is clear, then, that this psalm is sung to the sons of his passion. Calvary, right? Calvary, Calvities. Now, you see, the, the hill of the skull, it actually is related. Yeah. What's that? I'm sure Calvary, Alberta comes from the place where Jesus was crucified. <laughs> Probably. I mean, I don't really know Calvary, Alberta, but I would guess that that's a biblical allusion. So the purpose of all the suffering in the psalmist's complaint is that this faith of ours by which we are purified might be prepared for invisible things. That is, because all these things which have been done for understanding for the sons of Korah, in order that the things that they had might be taken away from the saints and their very temporal life taken away, that they would not care for the eternal, or in order that they would not care for the eternal for the sake of these temporal things, but rather by chaste love of it would tolerate all these things that they suffer for a time. So that's a kind of a complicated sentence there. Um, but what he's saying is they're the sons of Calvary, so they, they follow Christ to his death and they, and they live by the death of Christ. But he's going beyond that and saying um, that the, uh, the being bald is like taking away, taking away the glories of this world. You, you, you take away your hair that keeps you warm and makes you look good, um, and you, you, you take away the temporal things so that, you, um, so that you treasure instead the lowliness of Christ and the high things he has promised you instead. So that in this life, the hair does not distract you from the promises of the life to come. That's a little bit of an intimation of the third one, too. What language did Paul receive writing? Latin. Yeah. He wrote in Latin, um, and so he was using uh, a Latin Bible, uh, either probably the old Latin mostly, although he also had access to uh, Jerome's Vulgate. We know it because we have some letters where he criticizes one of Jerome's translations. <laughs> and Jerome says, you know, basically, how much do you know about Hebrew? <laughs> um, what was the Latin Bible before Jerome? Uh, it's, it goes by the name of the Vetus Latina, but that just means Old Latin. Like it was the Latin translation before Jerome. And it was a rendering of the Septuagint into Latin. So, and in fact, the, the what's that? A translation of the translation. Yes, right. Um, and so Jerome, when he translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Latin, did make some improvements. In fact, Augustine was criticizing one of the improvements um, because he said like, uh, the people were not expecting that word in the reading, and it caused a small riot in his church. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the Psalms, the, the Vulgate Psalms are actually not Jerome's Psalms from the Hebrew. The Vulgate, because the, the book of the Psalms was so entrenched, being prayed and being sung and all that, that the... It was one of the old Latin versions of the Psalms ended up being the, the primary Psalm text in the Vulgate. But the rest of the Old Testament is translated from the Hebrew. So, uh, incidentally, that's kind of like the same reason why the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and LSB say Christian, and the Athanasian Creed says Catholic. You know, like it was Catholic in all of them originally, um, and it got to be Christian because before the Reformation, that's how it was translated into German. Katholische didn't exist as a word then, so they translated Catholica as Christlica. And so 
Uh, in German, like if you look at the Book of Concord in the German and the Latin, the German side says the Holy Christian Church in all three creeds, and the Latin side says the Holy Catholic Church on all three sides. So when it's translated into English, then the German tradition gives us Holy Christian Church and the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, and they are said often enough that you can't change it to Catholic without people going, what? And having a mini riot in your church, right? But the Athanasian Creed, we say only once a year, right? Trinity Sunday, if that. And so, like, they've been able to go back and make the translation conform more to the original, um, like direct from the Latin into the English with that one without causing a riot. Yes. Maybe way off here, but without the, the unwillingness to even touch the Psalter, could have it been because it was the liturgy of the church? Yeah. With the piety and the liturgy of the church. Right. Well, it's that's true. Like you have that extra reverence for it because of that. But it's also the reverence that you share with all the common people who aren't going to hold any truck with your highfalutin explanation. <laughs> yeah. They're piety. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Like our English translation of the Lord's Prayer. Which part? Father, which who art in heaven, which shall be thy name, thy kingdom come. Yeah, we don't provide that. Right, right. All the, all the Jacobian English in there, you mean? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yes. Look at the Catholic Church that's wanting to rewrite the Lord's Prayer now. And they're kind of flat, they're catching on everything. Right, that's a good example. I, it's, it's a foolish thing to change the translation. Oh, yeah. You can explain what it means, don't change the translation. Right. <laughs> it's probably the publishing company. <laughs> hey, Frank, we got this idea. <laughs> All right, here's the prophet Elisha. The sons of Korah, who are they? Happily, the sons of the bridegroom. For the bridegroom was crucified in the place of Calvary. And so Calvary, baldness. Recollect the gospel where they crucified the Lord, and you will find him crucified in the place of Calvary. Furthermore, they who deride his cross by devils as by beasts are devoured. For this also a certain scripture signified. When God's prophet Elisha was going up, children called after him, mocking, Go up, thou bald head! Go up, thou bald head! But he, not so much in cruelty as in mystery, made those children to be devoured by bears. <laughs> it wasn't being cruel, it was, being, it was giving us revelation. Uh, bears out of the wood. Let none then mock the cross of Christ. The Jews were possessed by devils and devoured. For in the place of Calvary, crucifying Christ and lifting on the cross, they said, as it were, with childish sense, not understanding what they said, go up, thou bald head, for what is go up? Crucify him. Crucify him. Put him up on a cross. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the children were mocking Elisha because of the story that Elijah had gone up in a chariot into heaven, right? But um, here he's saying the Jews are like those children uh, because they're saying, go up onto the cross, crucify him. For the sons of Korah, the psalm is sung. For Christians, then, it is sung. Let us hear it as sons of the bridegroom, whom senseless children crucified in the place of Calvary. For they earned to be devoured by beasts, we to be crowned by angels. For we acknowledge the humility of our Lord, and of it are not ashamed. We are not ashamed of him called in mystery the bald, from the place of Calvary. For on the very cross whereon he was insulted, he permitted not our or for on the very cross whereon he was insulted, he permitted not our forehead to be bald, for with his own cross he marked it. Ash Wednesday. Well, in baptism, right? Receive the holy sign of the holy cross on your forehead and on your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. So because he's bald, we have that baldness covered. You gotta love this, even if you uh, question its soundness. <laughs> Oh, clap your hands, all you nations. Verse 1. We finally got to verse 1. <laughs> Were the people of the Jews all the nations? No, but blindness in part has happened to Israel, that senseless children might cry, Calve, Calve. And so the Lord might be crucified in the place of Calvary, 
that by his blood shed he might redeem the Gentiles, and that might be fulfilled, which says the apostle, blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Let them insult then the vain and foolish and senseless and say, Calve, Calve, but you, redeemed by his blood, which was shed in the place of Calvary, say, Oh, clap your hands, all you nations, because to you has come down the grace of God. Oh, clap your hands. What is, oh, clap? Rejoice. But wherefore with the hands? Because with good works. Do not rejoice with the mouth while idle with the hands. If you rejoice, clap your hands. And then, uh, just when you think, oh, this is brilliant, but really arbitrary, look at verse 5. God has gone up with jubilation. God has gone up with a shout. And this is one of our texts for the ascension, right? God has gone up with a shout. This is the psalm for the Feast of the Ascension. Um, There's the going up, right? He didn't just get to the going up from the fact that the sons of Korah, that means baldness, and Elisha was also bald, and the children said, go up. It's in the psalm. Like, it's actually in the psalm. And when you notice things like this, you're like, wait, that's creepy. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had, I had a class in grad school. It was all on Augustine's Enerationes on the psalms. And, um, you know, we read, we read from the Latin. There were just two of us in the class, so you couldn't hide. And... Um, <laughs> Thankfully, my Latin was better than the other guys. <laughs> um, but uh, reading all of these psalms and just being wowed by Augustine's ingenuity, but saying, yeah, but, uh, you know, but it's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, that's not really what the psalm means. You can't use it that way. And then one day, I ran across something that he said. I'm just like, wow, that works. <laughs> <laughs> that really just works. You know? And it was like I felt somebody step over my grave or something. Like, um, that's, maybe he's onto something. God has gone up with jubilation. Even he, our God, the Lord Christ, has gone up with jubilation. The Lord, with the sound of a trumpet, has gone up. Whither save where we know, whether the Jews followed him not, even with their eyes. For exalted on the cross, they mocked him. Ascending into heaven, they did not see him. All right, and now we get to the final usage, which has already been hinted at by something he said under the first one about how sharing the hairs away is like getting rid of the cares of this life. Um, Might have something to do with a tonsure. I don't know. Psalm 52 is not actually a Sons of Korah psalm, but, you know, it comes shortly after the 40s, which have a lot of Sons of Korah psalms in it. So Augustine is preaching on this one probably after he's, in the last couple of weeks, he's probably preached on the sons of Korah four or five times. He did a Lenten series on it, actually. Um, you know, that might help account for some of the Calvary emphasis, too. Um, so he's recently done a lot of Psalms of Korah Psalms, and so he's able to bring it into this one, too. To the end, for the understanding of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Now, if your, uh, if your recollection of the, is this 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel? I don't know. If your recollection of 1 and 2 Samuel is uh, a little shaky, what happens here is uh, David is fleeing from Saul, and he stops by the tabernacle, and he gets help from the priests. Right? And he tells the priest, I'm on a secret mission for Saul. I can't stay. Um, and so they help him out. And then Doeg the Edomite, um, who is uh, one of Saul's servants, he learns of this and he tells Saul. And Saul wants the priests killed for helping David. And Doeg does it. Like Doeg does, he goes and he slaughters the priests. And one of the priests escapes and takes the ephod to David and hides out with him as his friar tuck, basically. So now verse 2 of Psalm 50. Notice there's that uh, Vulgate numeration. Psalm 52 in modern Bibles. As with a sharp razor you have done deceit. At least that's what it says in the Vulgate. I, I know, I think it says that in the English and modern translations too. As with a sharp like razor. A sharp yeah. You who practice deceit. Okay. Uh, they're likened to a sharp razor. See what do evil men to saints? They scrape their hair. 
What is it that I have said? If there be such citizens of Jerusalem that hear the voice of their Lord, of their king, saying, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, that hear the voice which but now from the gospel has been read, what does it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and of himself make wreck? They despise all present good things and above all life itself. And what is Doeg's razor to do to a man on this earth meditating on the kingdom of heaven and about to be in the kingdom of heaven, having with him God and about to abide with God? What is that razor to do? Hair it is to scrape. It is to make a man bald. And this belongs to Christ, who in the place of a skull was crucified. What can the Doegs of this world do to you? You know, they think they're a Bowie knife that's going to put an end to you. They're just a razor. They're just going to shave you. They're going to shave away the glories of this world, and they're going to make you bald like Jesus. It makes also the son of Korah, which is interpreted baldest. That is, the razor makes you a son of Korah. For this hair signifies a superfluity of things temporal, which hairs indeed are not made by God superfluously on the body of men, but for a sort of ornament. Yet because without feeling they are cut off, they that cleave to the Lord with their heart, so have these earthly things as they have hair. But sometimes even something of good with hair is wrought. When you break bread to the hungry, the poor without roof you bring into your house. If you shall have seen one naked, you cover him. Lastly, the martyrs themselves also imitating the Lord. Uh, blood for the church shedding, hearing that voice, as Christ laid down his life for us, so also we ought to lay it down for the brethren. In a certain way, with their hair did good to us. That is, with those things which that razor can lop, lop off or scrape. But that, therefore, even with the very hair, some good can be done. Even that woman, a sinner, intimated, who when she had wept over the feet of the Lord with her hair, wiped what with tears she wetted. Signifying what? That when you shall have pitied anyone, you ought to relieve him also if you can. For when you have pity, you shed as it were tears. When you relieve, you wipe with hair. And if this to anyone... How much more to the feet of the Lord? The feet of the Lord are what? The holy evangelists, whereof is said, how beautiful are the feet of them that tell the peace, that tell of good, that tell of peace, that tell of good things. Therefore, like a razor, let Doeg wet his tongue. Let him wet deceit as much as he may. He will take away superfluous temporal things. Will he necessary things everlasting? So persecution gets rid of the hair. Um, Charity also gets rid of the hair in a different way. Um, but to, take, to cut the hair doesn't hurt. And if you, uh, if you properly evaluate the things of this world in light of the things of eternity, then to give up the things of this world won't hurt either. It'll just make you more like Christ. <clears throat>